of CNA's marking its 25th anniversary this month. And so we're taking the opportunity to look ahead to the next quarter century here in Asia. This week, we focus on five topics, defense, tech, business and work, healthcare and climate change. Today, we begin with defense. CNA's Chan Yuim is our lead editor on this project. Defense is paramount to the future of Asia. Without it, it's tough to plan for other priorities, from growing businesses to confronting the climate crisis. So we're looking at three broad areas, the Taiwan Strait, the South China Sea and the Korean Peninsula. CNA's Lim Yon Suk starts things off for us. South Koreans are always intrigued by North Korea. Because all communication and contact is banned by both sides, this is the next best thing to getting a glimpse of the other side. It's been like this since the end of the three-year Korean War in 1953. While there were hopes for reunification in the past, many analysts don't see that happening in the near future. Especially since North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un in January said creating a single sovereign Korean state was no longer possible. Jenny Town is a senior fellow and director at 38 North, a Washington-based North Korean research organization. North Korea has deemed South Korea now the principal enemy, the primary enemy of the state. I think with every year that goes by that we don't have unification, um, that the prospects do become less and less over time. Um, we're talking, you know, more than 70 years already of separation. She says recent threats by North Korea should be taken seriously because they could escalate into a possible conflict, even though both South and North Korea don't want a war. Particularly as South Korea and the U.S. deepen their extended deterrence. I think there's there definitely is a reason for concern about how this escalates because we are kind of stuck on this spiral of drill for drill for drill for drill. Even if a full-scale war can be avoided, analysts say there's always a possibility that North Korea's provocations could include bombings of islands near the disputed Western Sea border. Professor Kim dong yup at the University of North Korea Studies in Seoul believes real peace is unlikely to happen on the Korean Peninsula under the current situation. The danger of a major war has disappeared, but from the point of view of the people, from the point of view of those of us who live on the Korean Peninsula, we have to live under the threat of military threats and the threat of conflict all the time. Just because we don't go to war, can we call this peace? Maybe we're going to have to live in a very uncomfortable fake peace. And Wally says something must be done to change that fake peace into real peace. He does not predict North Korea will team up with its two closest allies, Russia and China, the way South Korea has with the U.S. and Japan to beef up security cooperation. <laughs> It's not correct to think that China has empathy with relations between North Korea and Russia. In fact, it feels it could lower China's status. China thinks it's a bilateral issue between North Korea and Russia, and that's why it's not supporting it and just letting it be. Although Jenny Town of 38 North agrees trilateral cooperation is unlikely, she is concerned about deepening ties between Moscow and Pyongyang. It does create um, more challenges in trying to in trying to establish any kind of diplomatic track with the North Koreans, um, even on things like risk reduction. And surveys suggest that South Koreans, especially the younger generation, favor less risk over reunification. That's because South Koreans believe the two Koreas have been divided for too long and it's impossible to live together. For many of them, reunification no longer means living under one Korea and one government, but rather living in harmony with no possibility of a conflict breaking out on the Korean Peninsula. Here is Professor Kim again.
10년, 20년 후에 그렇게 그냥 두면 가겠지만. If we leave the situation as it is, it will be the same in 10 or 20 years from now. But we must not let that happen. I think we need the integration of people. If we have lots of South Koreans in North Korea's Pyongyang and lots of North Koreans in our South Korean land, can the two Koreas then easily shoot at each other? Lim Yon Suk, CNA, Seoul. It was March 2013, days before he was elected to his first term as president, Chinese leader Xi Jinping told a group of military leaders in Beijing that China has a dream. A dream to transform the People's Liberation Army into a world-class military, along with bringing Taiwan back to the motherland. Military modernization formed the key pillars of the Chinese leader's so-called national rejuvenation goal to be achieved by 2049. At its recently concluded annual political meetings, China announced that it would be maintaining the increase in its defence spending at 7.2% for this year. Now this comes not only amid tensions in the Taiwan Strait, but other potential flashpoints in its backyard, including in the South China Sea and on the Korean Peninsula. But as China's military budget consistently rose for the last three decades, so has wariness over its growing military might. China has said it will never renounce the right to use force to take back Taiwan. Analysts said strengthening its army is China's legitimate right. But with Taiwan in the equation, it has inevitably aroused suspicion. Dr. Benjamin Ho is the assistant professor of the China program at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. It reflects a more, more generically a Chinese intention to become strong. They're still far from the United States, but to ensure that within the region it is able to safeguard its, its borders. So I wouldn't overly read as that as a clear intention of trying to take Taiwan. Uh, but that said, any conflict over the Taiwan Straits is inevitably going to draw in countries around the region, uh, Philippines, Japan, maybe even Vietnam. And that's not good. The Chinese view this as a domestic issue, but I'm pretty sure the rest of the countries outside of China view it as an issue with regional, if not international, uh, implications. The world needs no reminder how testy the situation could be. Tensions flared recently after a deadly incident in Taiwan-controlled waters near the Kinmen Island. Two Chinese fishermen died after a pursuit by Taiwan's Coast Guard, setting off a series of maritime encounters between the two sides. Associate Professor of Political Science Chong Jia Yin from the National University of Singapore explained. I think that Beijing doesn't want escalation. Part of it, I think, is concern uh, over its own domestic economy, uh, its own dem uh, demographic issues that will, I suppose, get Beijing to be a little bit more cautious, but only up to a point. If things uh, get you know, worse, there is always the temptation of uh, appealing to nationalism and looking strong. And one area where uh, that could manifest is with regard to Taiwan. Inside the Great Hall of the People in Beijing, the Chinese political elite's position on the Taiwan question is clear. I think we are all one family. The motherland will be reunified sooner or later. I think it should be sped up. In 2018, these political elites approved constitutional amendments that removed presidential term limits, allowing President Xi to remain in office indefinitely. President Xi will be 96 by 2049, while the People's Republic of China will turn 100. The unknown, though, is the PLA's position among the world's mightiest militaries. Olivia Xiang, CNA, Beijing. All is not calm in the South China Sea. Recent and more aggressive run-ins such as this between China and the Philippines have seen accusations fly from alleged intrusion to infringement of sovereignty. The contested waterway is strategically vital. More than a third of global shipping passes through each year. The area also boasts a wealth of natural resources. Beijing claims nearly all of the water body, despite an international tribunal ruling that there is no legal basis. This famous U-shaped line, the source of tension with the host of Southeast Asian nations. 
ASEAN. For more than 20 years, ASEAN and China have been trying to create a framework to negotiate a legally binding code of conduct. To date, little progress has been made beyond something largely symbolic. Sharon Sia is an academic focusing on ASEAN at the ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute. I think ASEAN is increasingly uh, sitting on edge you know, regarding what's happening in the South China Sea. Uh, at this moment, the declaration of the Code of Conduct is all that ASEAN has with China. Rizwan Rahmat, a principal defence analyst with Jane's, adds that in the past two decades, the dispute has become more global. Australia recently pledged millions to boost maritime security with ASEAN. Navies from Germany and Canada are in the region. And American freedom of navigation operations are often condemned by China. Mr Ridzwan adds that the presence of these warships builds interoperability between navies in the region and elevates the war readiness of Southeast Asian countries. So my concern with the South China Sea conflicts uh, in the next few years is that with the presence of these many warships, you know, the chances of a miscalculation happening between the naval services are very high. The fact that we don't have a code of conduct on how the parties should be behaving uh, is one of the reasons why you know, we are saying that uh, the chances of a, a conflict escalating from a small incidents will be higher uh, in the next few years. Away from choppy waters, ASEAN is seeking unity on another regional security threat, Myanmar's ongoing conflict. Analysts say last October's offensive launched by three ethnic insurgent groups is the most serious challenge the military since the 2021 coup. In February, the Myanmar army enforced a dormant military enlistment law. Now that sparked fear among young men and women who started applying for visas to work overseas. One immediate concern is brain drain. The other is escalated violence. Civilian troops and some ethnic armed groups are seeing results from using drones to bomb military targets. Experts say the shifting nature of warfare in Myanmar and elsewhere, such as Ukraine, has changed calculations for military planners everywhere. And looking at the coming decades, deteriorating security conditions could reshape ASEAN cooperation beyond civil, economic and political matters. Here's defence analyst Ritzwan Rahmat again. I think it is inevitable that ASEAN itself will have a security and military component to it. Uh, I think it will be just a matter of time before military exercises between ASEAN members are being conducted under the ambit of ASEAN. Therefore, ASEAN itself uh, as an institution, as a framework, will transform in the light of this escalating uh, security situation in the region. For the leaders of tomorrow, Southeast Asia boasts a great deal of promise but also poses security challenges that will require deft diplomacy to ensure a broader peace and order are maintained. Leung Waikit, CNA. Quite a few takeaways for many militaries from ongoing conflicts. All of this has highlighted the need to expect the unexpected. One prevailing sentiment is, could my country become the next place where the unthinkable happens? For example, after the Hamas attack on Israel last October, the Indian Army commissioned a study on the situation, citing that underestimating an adversary is the defining line between victory or defeat. The Israel attack and Ukraine invasion also not lost on Taiwan. Its military has been studying what happened and the outcomes. Now, with the South China Sea, there is the strengthened alliances between the U.S. and its allies, from the Philippines to Japan and South Korea to Australia and the UK. Now, these groupings China labels as block diplomacy, the Quad, AUKUS and others. And with so many small alliances and cliques and navies in these disputed waters, it may not take much for a small miscalculation to result in something ugly. Well, tomorrow, our CNA 25 series turns to technology. We'll look at the race for supremacy when it comes to semiconductors and quantum computing, as well as artificial intelligence.